traveled across those waters with us all the way to the Americas and Caribbean and anywhere else that we found ourselves in this world as African people, as black people. And that tradition is to pay respects to our ancestors who laid the path and the foundation and laid the blueprint so that we might live today as free human beings in this world. And with that in mind, I have a big brother who's a spiritualist. He understands, he knows. I didn't say believes, he knows things. And so we want to bring him to the stage, one of the warriors, the great legends in our community, a strong, beautiful warrior who's always there for his people and has sacrificed many years of his life on behalf of us, but he is still here. He's my big brother and a big brother to many in the community here, Ababa. Let's give our hands and bring them together for Akil Kuji Chagalia. Give it up for Brother Akil. Thank you. Thank you, Tori. Time flies. Time is flying. Yes, this ritual, and that's what it is, it's a rite. It's a rite of bringing us in conjunction and in harmony with those unseen forces whom we refer to as ancestors. And we pour water because we say, as my, my big brother, Imodoye, Amoye Imodoye Shabazz says, water has no enemies, and indeed it doesn't. I will begin, and I'm going to do this in Yoruba as well as in English. Omi tutu, omi, water, tutu, fresh, fresh water. Ana tutu, our road, ana, to freshen our road. Ile tutu, to freshen the place in which we now find ourselves. Ile meaning place, and tutu again, fresh, to freshen this place. Ashe. Tutu la roye. La Roye, any uncertainty, any hesitancy, any problem. La Roye, let that problem be no bigger than a pimple or a molehill, something that we can easily overcome. Kosi Ku, so that death is no more. Ku, death, so that death is no more. Kosi Ku. Kosi Eyo, so that tragedy is no more. Kosi Ofo, so that losses are no more. Kosi Arun, so that sickness is no more. Areku Babawa, don't let us see death, our Father. Mojuba Olofi, I praise God. Mojuba Bogbo, Orisha. Mojuba Bogbo, Ikumi in Balese Iba Ara Orun. I praise and honor all of the dead who sit at the foot of Oludumare, God, chief of the heavenly realm, Ashe. And I call upon the likes of Paul Robeson, Ashe. Call upon the likes of Marcus Mosiah Garvey, Ashe. Call upon Elijah Muhammad, Ashe. I call upon Samaya Kambui, Ashe. I call upon Nina Simone, Ashe. I call upon Billy Holiday, Ashe. I call upon Moseka. I can't think of her name at this point in time. But I call upon all of those sisters who, such as Lena Horn, Ashe, such as Seconds, okay. Ida B. Wells, Harriet Tubman, Sir Jonah Truth, Martin Delaney, Frederick Douglass, Nat Turner, John Brown, and many more. Ashe! Ashe A.O. It's honorable that we do these things, and it's honorable that we remember for what it is that he's doing here. 
This is an important aspect of our culture. This strengthens our collective soul called the ku, the collective or national soul. It's important that we remember that and we honor those who came before us. Ashe, Asheo. Thank you. Okay, right, right about now. Uh, again, the press conference that you're looking at right now, the theme is called Radical Reconstruction. We're talking about how we demand change in America. We demand change in the systems that run this country. Okay? Coming up next is a queen mother, a woman who is a warrior in the tradition of Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and Queen Hatshepsut and so many more that we could talk about Ida B. Wells. She's been with us in this community as a shining light and an example of what a black queen mother should be and should stand for. And any time that I've been uh, in, 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 in any type of uh, uh, turmoil or whatever else in my life and in my career, I know that there's one black woman that I can call on that comes whenever she can, and she's here tonight. She's an author, she's an editor, she's an educator, she's a mother, a grandmother, an activist. Put your hands together for a legend in our community, Dr. Rosie Milligan, Dr. Rosie Milligan. Thank you, Tori, and to my brothers and sisters, I'm here tonight to say that 2020 has been a year that we will always remember. And it should also be a year that we should never forget. One thing that we know that we must make changes in every aspect of our lives, in the health field with much disparity, in the educational field, in every term and every condition, we must rise. We must not be content from the jubilation that we have felt uh, during the election, because many of us would tend to go home and sit down now because we feel like we have voted. We feel like we are responsible for getting uh, the president elected president and the vice president. We are excited now because we have a, a black woman who uh, was heeding to the vice president. We're happy, but we must also remember that we must push forward. It's not enough when the elation, the celebration is down. We must understand that there's still systemic racism, there's still much injustice, and it will not come, will not be erected to the level that we need it unless we push forward. We must push forward as hard as we push forward to get people out to vote. We're going for the presidential election. We're gonna to have to push them to vote for the electoral that takes place right in our city with what's going on with our schools, with what's going on with the homelessness, what's going on with uh, the taking of the building and, and all the things that's taking place. But I want to say to you tonight, as you began to do a lot of chat, every corner I stop by, people are so political astute these days, Tori. Everybody knows about the political system. But I want to say to you in closing tonight, I suggest that you not put your focus on the White House. I want you to put your focus on the Black House because that is the house that's burning down. That is the house that's on fire. So don't get all caught up in it. It's time now to move forward. The fight is just now began because now we have to understand what are you going to do for us. I'm going to repeat that and I'm going to my, going to my seat or wherever I'm going. The question becomes now, what are you going to do for us? I'm not talking about what you're going to do for everybody. I'm talking about what are you going to do for black folks? We cannot rest. We must move forward. We must move with the same force that we move for the election. Folks, don't go home and sit down. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. I said don't sit down. There's no time to sit down. It's time to get up. It's time to stand up, it's time to speak up, and it's time to do up. Thank you very much, you guys. All right. One more time for Dr. Rosie Milligan. All right. Well, there's more of y'all out there than I thought. <laughs> y'all sound good. We can hear your beautiful voices up here. I want to thank, before I go on, all of the volunteers, all of the volunteers, the beautiful people who give their time, to help put on an event like this. Give them all of a round of applause and give yourselves a round of applause. All right? 
special round of applause for a young man who came to me about a year ago and said he wanted to help the community. Heard about what we were doing and jumped right in. And it's been a tremendous help to lift the organization to a new level. Give it up for my brother, Anthony Mazi. Anthony, where is he? A.M. He's out here right now somewhere. <laughs> OK. Anyway, let's go right along. Uh, coming up next is a young man who, in the 1960s and in the 70s, was a part of an organization whose spirit lives on. It was founded in October the 15th, 1966, in Oakland, California. And in 1968, here in Los Angeles, they opened the chapter uh, with the assistance and the vision of a fiery young warrior named Bunchy Carter. Unfortunately, Bunchy, Bunchy's career is very short. We know why. We're not going to get into all of that. But this brother was right there. And I just wanted him to come and say a couple words to us on behalf of us and for us with whatever he has on his heart. So give it up for one of the great visual artists, because he's a great visual artist also, and one of the great warriors in our community, Mr. Mohammed Mubarak. Mohammed Mubarak. Give it up for him, y'all. Black Panther. Assalamu alaikum. It is an honor and a privilege to be standing here in the uh, area of Baldwin Hills. And back in the 60s, when I was a youngster, I used to, uh, I grew up out in Compton, by the way. And when I joined the Black Panther Party, I joined the Black Panther Party by being recruited by John Huggins, who got killed with Bunchy Carter. 1968, October, I joined the Black Panther Party. And during that time, I met a lot of young brothers and sisters who, from all parts of this city, all parts of the town of Los Angeles, all corners of this city, gang members, students, uh, drug dealers, they all came into the Black Panther Party. Vietnam vets. I met a lot of them. And we all focused on becoming politically educated and learning how the system worked and learning how we could fight back and defend ourselves against the police who were aggressively coming at us and brutalizing us and learning how to fight against the oppressor of the system that was totally against us and still is today. I say to all the young people today, from what I have learned, it's not enough for us to fight each other. I tell all these young people, put your guns down, stop shooting each other, come together and formulate a plan to renovate yourself and redevelop your community. This message is for all the young people who don't know who their enemy really is. There's a threat to us right now that exists in this country. And the biggest threat is not only us fighting each other, but you have some armed white militias that are all across this country that hate black folk, that are arming themselves and walking down the streets with their guns in the open and not afraid to get arrested. We have a real enemy that's against us. Donald Trump, our current president, is encouraging them to fight against us. So now you see why it's important for us to put the guns down from shooting each other, come together, all parts of this country, all black folk, I don't care where you come from or where you call yourself to be, if you're black, come together. Organize yourself and mobilize yourself against all that's against us right now. 
And I think it's very important to uh, educate yourself, educate your kids, make them become aware of what is really going on, and learn who the real enemy is. It's not your neighbor. It's not the brothers across the street or down the street or on the other side of town. The real enemy is the system that's against you and against us. So let's fight back. Let's fight back together. Let's organize ourselves and mobilize ourselves, and become one black army, one black force, one black community, and stack up some money so we can own some land. That's what we need to do. Let's take it to another level. All power to all the people. Thank you. All right. One more time for Brother Mohammed Mubarak, Black Panther, activist, artist, father, grandfather. All right. Ain't nothing like being a grandfather. Once you reach that status, you done done something. I don't care what else you do in your life. When you reach that grandfather status, yeah, you done done something. <laughs> yes, indeed. Anyway, we continue the press conference. Radical reconstruction, a change has come. We want everybody to study the period of reconstruction. And you'll find that for 12 years, black folks proved that they were just as good as anybody on this planet. Opening their own businesses, running for and winning political offices, owning their own land, scared the hell out of America. Scared the hell out of them. Black excellence has always done that. We have a film called Black Wall Street we're gonna show. I think we're showing it tonight. When you look at this film, you'll see what I'm talking about. At any rate, let's bring up the next speaker. He's an educator, historian, artist, poet, writer, and one of the architects of the political and cultural movement growing out of the world stage, which is ground zero for culture, black culture, in the Mert Park African village, and it's certainly in this city that we call Los Angeles. He's a good friend and brother of mine who speaks with a sharp tongue, and he has a word for you tonight. Let us all put our hands together and welcome a good brother, Connie Williams. Connie Williams. Come on, Connie. <laughs> Thank you, Tori. The name of this festival is called I've Known Rivers. And black people have known rivers. What kind of rivers? We've known shallow rivers, rivers that were insufficient, rivers too shallow to provide nourishment, rivers that were incapable of sustaining communities and neighborhoods. Black people have known rivers what kind of rivers? We've known muddy rivers, rivers that have tried to obscure our vision, block our ability to see ourselves as we are, rivers that are so muddy that we have no ability to cross them. We, black people, have known rivers. What kind of rivers? We've known wide rivers, rivers as wide as oceans, fraught with danger, suicide, murder, sharks, rivers so wide that those who created them thought that they were impassable, but yet here we are today. Black people have known rivers. What kind of rivers? We've known rivers because we create rivers. Rivers that are pure, drinkable. Rivers that become arteries to sustain communities and families and neighborhoods. 
in spite of everything, today, in 2020, black people are still creating rivers. So black people have known rivers. What kind of rivers? Insurmountable rivers, high-reaching rivers, rivers that are as wide as the world is long, as far as the stars can reach. We have known rivers. So go out today and create rivers that will continue to sustain this great people. Bless you tonight. We've known rivers. Now, in his other life, he was a Baptist preacher. A Pentecostal. Man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, why don't you come up here and say something, Miss Comedian? <laughs> anyway, about 25 years ago, God put it on my heart to do something to honor the legacy and the memory of a man who, who I learned about when I was 12 years old. Because my mother, Gwendolyn, oh, let me say hello to my mother. Hi, Mom. How you doing? Love you, Mom. She's in New Orleans right now, 80 years young. <laughs> she made sure that every Saturday, unless we went to the movie theater, drive-ins, that she took us to the library and made us read books. I love books. I have a t-shirt that says, books saved my life. And so, mom gave me a book when I was 12 years old called The Autobiography of Malcolm X. And uh, it was the most compelling literary document that I had ever read in my life. And I still consider it at the top of my list in terms of literature. So anyway, we started with something called the Malcolm X Festival in 1993. And the next year, two years later, we started an effort to rename Crenshaw to Malcolm X Boulevard. What do y'all think about that? I'm checking, I'm, I'm checking for your black meter now. I said we wanted to rename Crenshaw to Malcolm X Boulevard. <laughs> so, of course, if you know anything about Malcolm, you know we ran into some obstacles and barriers and challenges and all that. And I had a brother to come into my life back in those days. I don't know where he came from. Yes, I do know where he came from, actually. He comes from the East Coast, Philadelphia. Oh, that brother come from Philadelphia. I think West Philadelphia, if y'all know what I'm talking about. And he made it out. He became an activist, educator, organizer, strategizer. And my brother, thick as blood. And he's been by my side, and I've been by his side ever since then. And we didn't walk through some hellish waters together, and we're continuing that walk now. And so he's going to come up and just speak for a couple minutes about why we'd like to now join Crenshaw to Malcolm X Boulevard, as they did with Lenox Boulevard in Harlem, New York. Lenox and Malcolm X exist, they coexist together in New York and Harlem. And we want to do the same thing here, and we want the support of the mayor, all of the council people, and everybody else who has anything to say about culture, because we feel like when we rename the community, right, when we rename the community, we put a stamp on a community that's necessary and critical to our development and that of our children. So join me in welcoming a good man, a warrior for you. Give it up for Mr. Shaka Satori, Shaka Satori. Come on, Shaka. Greetings, family. Only thing, I, only thing I can add to the great things that have been said uh, so far is that I, I think in every time there were those who understood the conditions of that time represented a call to action. Whether we talk about Harriet Tubman, whether we talk about Denmark Vesey, uh, Nat Turner, whether we talk about uh, moving forward to Martin and Malcolm. They understood that the conditions of that time represented a call to action, and they stepped up. And I don't know about you guys, but these past few decades, and especially these past few years, I think represents a call to action for us. I think a big part of that like Brother Tory said, in terms of you know, Malcolm X Boulevard and that type of thing is, we have to claim what's ours. 
We all know that gentrification is happening all over this country. It's been happening. And it's happening right here where we stand. It's time to claim ours. I, I actually live in Koreatown right now. You, you know it when you hit Koreatown. You know it. The same thing needs to be done here. This is the premier cultural center in Los Angeles. Martin Luther King Boulevard is not enough. Obama Boulevard is not enough. Uh, Nipsey Hussle Square is not enough. We need to add that Malcolm X Boulevard. Then we need to go to Harriet Tubman. We need to go to uh, Paul Robeson. James Baldwin, for sure. Ida B. Wells, for sure. When people come into this community, they need to know where they are. We're not saying stay out. We're saying know where you are and respect where you are. We need for our kids, when they're walking to school every morning, to be looking up and their street signs and their building names and everything else reflect their greatness. Not the greatness of Crenshaw. We have an opportunity here, I think, for the next few years to make a stand and not let this community go so easily. And I'm just calling upon you to join us in doing just that. Thank you very much. All right. We have one more speaker, and then we're going to get to the film portion tonight. And this speaker is a great talent, all-around talent, actress, etc. She's going to come and say something to you. She's uh, one of the people that took one of my jobs. She don't know it yet. She took one of my jobs. I had a hosting job. And I turned my back, and she was on stage, and she's been there ever since. <laughs> but she's doing a fantastic job, and she's prettier than me, so I understand. <laughs> so let's give a great round of applause to one of our brilliant talents in our community, gifted young lady, Miss Ramona Stevens. Stevens. Clap your hands. What's wrong with y'all? How's everybody doing out there? Y'all all right? I'm telling you. Okay. Anybody want to break in the mall and get something for Christmas? I'm just playing. <laughs> I am so honored to be here. We had some great speakers. Y'all give it up for everybody that spoke before I got to the stage. Give it up for them. Elegant speakers. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually a comedian, so um, I'm not getting ready to say anything about history. <laughs> Because um, I, I make people laugh. But you know, a lot of times comedy is pain, and we make it funny to keep from crying. Y'all know that? Yeah, yeah. My brother up here was talking about gentrification. I knew white people was coming to the neighborhood when I saw the bike lanes on Coliseum and King. I was like, yep. Because <laughs> black people, we ride on the sidewalk. You know what I'm saying? We, we don't trust the bike lanes, I'm telling you. And we, and we definitely don't know the hand signals about turning right and left, you know. When, when you're doing this, we think you're waving, so keep your hands on the wheel, white people. Just keep your hands on the wheel. Yeah, I am Ashley from Georgia. Anybody from the South? Any? Yeah. We got South Central LA in the house. How y'all doing? <laughs> well, I'm a Georgia country girl, so when I moved to LA, it was people like Tori that really taught me my history of who I am as a black woman. And once I became who I really am as a black woman, I became basically unshakable. So when we start learning our history, when we start really learning the people, I'm not talking about the famous history people, you know, like um, the Underground Railroad, um, what's her name? Uh, Harriet Tubman. I mean, she's famous, everybody know, know her. I'm talking about the average, everyday life of a black person. When we start learning that history, we can't say, I'm tired. We can't say, I'm sleepy. We can't say, I'm hungry. We can't say, I, have the, I don't have the right car. We can't, we can't say, I, ha I don't have the right house. We, we don't have the privilege to say that anymore. Once we really learn our history and know where we come from and what our ancestors did to get us to where we are today. 
We can't complain about nothing. You know, if you got a roof over your head and every night you sleep in a bed and you don't worry about food you fed and you amongst the living not dead, you really can't complain about nothing. We blessed. And we, we, we more blessed than any other race on the earth. You know why? Because like Connie said, we've been through the rivers. We've been through the struggle. We've been through the fight and we still here. We ain't going nowhere. You want me to tell you one of my favorite things to do since the pandemic? I like to go to the 99 cent store and watch white people panic. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I like to see them fighting for that dollar loaf of bread now. You know what I'm saying? It ain't, it ain't bothering us because we used to it. We, we know how, we, we making bread. We don't have to worry about it. I remember before the pandemic, you know, they don't want us in the grocery store every five minutes. I must have ran to the grocery store two or three times a week, sometimes four or five times a week. But now, through the pandemic, I realized, hey, if I'm getting ready to make some pancakes and I don't have no butter, them going to be some dry pancakes. You know what I'm saying? Because it's in my DNA. I know how to survive. If I don't have no syrup, I'm going to spread some jelly on that pancake. You know what I'm saying? I'm learning what I don't need. We spoiled. That's what's going on with us. We done came so far, we done forgot what others did to get us that far. You got black people with an education, master's degree, bachelor's degree, still literate in their own community. You educated. You got children watching you. They see mom and daddy throw the paper on the grass, they gonna throw the paper on the grass. I live over there in the jungle, it's getting gentrified. There was a white man that moved in the building next to me and he saw, I saw him coming from our trash can, throwing the trash, his trash in our dumpster. And he started apologizing. I'm so sorry for using your trash can. I said, you ain't got to apologize for throwing some trash in the trash can. I ain't mad at him, you know. Maybe y'all white people set an example. <laughs> and so, this is one of the nicest neighborhoods in LA. Centrally located, next to the 405, the 105, the 10, all the freeways, 15 minutes to Cover City, 20 minutes to Beverly Hills, and we don't even appreciate it. We got to do better. We got, and that's why I like programs like this and people like Tori that asked me to be involved in something so important. In my opinion, this parking lot should be packed. He's getting ready to show a documentary of some stuff that people don't even know about it. I didn't even know about it until I started surrounding myself with people that know our history. I think the more people start learning their history, the more... We, it, that, what's wrong with 10 black people getting together and buying one building? And then this 10 get together and buy one building? Because Michael Kors and Louis Vuitton don't give a damn about us. You know, you go to the nail shop and, and add that up 15, 20 years every week going to get your nails. I stopped going when I realized they weren't even painting my whole pinky toe. I stopped going. I'm giving you $45, $50 and you can't even paint the whole pinky toe. <laughs> Let me stop talking about them people. Let me stop talking about them people. Anyway, my name is Ramona Stevens. I'm a professional comedian. I'm going to come back tomorrow night and give y'all some more. I'll have more jokes tomorrow night. I just wanted to get up here like the speakers did and let y'all know that this is very important. All jokes aside, we need to tell. If you're here tonight, tell some other people to get them a ticket so the parking lot can be packed on Saturday night. My name is Ramona Stevens. I'm getting out of here. One more time for Ramona Stevens. <laughs> brilliant. She is so brilliant. <laughs> All right. I think that's it. Again, we want to thank uh, the mayor of the city of Los Angeles and Darst us, the mayor, uh, the congressional people, all of the politicians, and supported us more this year than any other year. Well, they, everybody black now and black is in vogue. <laughs> <laughs> something else. That was a joke. I was trying to follow after Ramona. Didn't work that well. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. But we don't think. There you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep that. I'll stick this thing in. All right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we got my brother Patrick Green out there, also better known as Brother Satek, also known as Abid. That's the name that I met him. Abid. And so we want to thank everybody who came out, Sister Nzinga, 
and all of the beautiful volunteers, everybody. And we can think, we're going to be thanking people all this weekend. But we really want to thank all the people who are showing up now. Look, it's starting, to, it's starting to be some cars out here and everything. So this is what we want to do, drive in movies, right? So we're going to start out uh, in just a few minutes with our first film. So we want you to sit back, relax, um, and hey, you got a couple of stores open here. You know, if you want to get yourself some food and stuff like that. And uh, enjoy drive-in movies. Been around since the 1930s, became very popular throughout the 40s and 50s and 60s. Drive-in movies started going out of style in the 70s and in the early 80s. And now, for obvious reasons, they're back. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the ninth annual I Have Known Rivers Film Festival of Arts, Culture, and Education with the theme, Radical Reconstruction, A Change Has Come. Peace, love, and soul. I'll see y'all in a minute. Thank you.